I have um, two grandchildren. One just started first grade in the fall. And you can picture the scene. You've all been through it or witnessed it from many sides. But the anxiety of going to a new school, the kind of fear, the trepidation of, of being left and getting all brave and being able to face it and then breaking down and crying for the first 15 minutes because it's so scary. Who am I? Who am I in the world? Will I be taken care of? Will I be safe? We think of it for kindergartners, but do you remember coming from high school to the university or to college? It's the same issue. It's the exact same problem. I remember when my oldest son, well, I won't tell you the whole story of my separation anxiety problems. When I dropped my kids at college, I have terrible, terrible, se I'm like a kindergartner, you know. I hate leaving my kids. But in any case, my oldest son is now 33, went off to Brown University, and we were talking on the phone a month or so after school started, and he said to me, you know, Poppy, you never told me about Kierkegaard. And I thought, damn, I knew I forgot something. I didn't, I didn't tell him about Kierkegaard. But think about it. He's gone off to university. He suddenly dis discovered there's such a thing as archaeology. There's such a thing as philosophy. Who knew? I mean, we don't teach philosophy in high school in the United States. Maybe you do here. We should, incidentally. Teach it in kindergarten, incidentally. But, um, but you know, that notion that there's a bigger world out there. And who am I in the world? That is a huge, huge question for every kid going to school. And the good school, the good classroom, the good teacher is someone who knows that that question exists and finds a way to embrace that question with generosity and, and expansiveness, even though they can't fully answer it and, and has a spinal injury. He's learning to walk. He's 34 years old. His curriculum is learning to walk. That's not your curriculum, but it's his. And that's because that knowledge and experience is of most value to him. When my elderly father moved in with us many years ago uh, and had Alzheimer's and lived with us for several years and then passed away in our house, my curriculum became dementia. How do I understand Alzheimer's? How do I understand how to care for an elderly person? When he passed away, incidentally, I said to my wife, we've gotten so good at taking care of old people, we should get some to move in. She said, you're already here. And I thought that was really <laughs> very unfair. But, but you see what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that everyone has a curriculum. And while we can, ex we can say pretty much for certain that kids in kindergarten, kids in early childhood need, thank you very much, they need opportunities to learn the literacies you know, that are out there. Still, it is the case that curriculum is never one size fits all. It's always an invitation to answer the questions, who am I in the world? what's valuable for me to know, and so on. But what this takes me to is the second commitment. If commitment number one, or the first intellectual challenge of teaching is seeing the student, and a commitment to seeing the student whole is what you bring. A second intellectual challenge is to create an environment that's deep enough and wide enough and, and, and kind of challenging enough and nourishing enough so that everyone who walks through the door find something familiar and something strange, something that they're comfortable with and something that they must bridge beyond. That means the classrooms rather, and I learned this incidentally about the power of the environment. When I was a young teacher, um, I was 20, 20 years old, and I used to take my kids to the Met Detroit Metropolitan Airport. You know, I would take my kids on a field trip, all these five-year-olds, right? And we'd get to the airport, and there would be the concourse. You know what a concourse looks like. And this was before Homeland Security and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So there was just a concourse. And we got to the mouth of the concourse, and what did those five-year-olds do? I had seven or eight of them. What did they do? You know five-year-olds. Of course. They ran. Of course, because they saw a corridor, and the corridor said to them, run. I didn't say run. I said, don't run. And, and they ran anyway. So the next time I took them, I, I, I knew better, and I said, look, everybody has to have a trip book. Everybody has to hold hands. Everybody has to stay together. When you get to the end of the corridor, I'll give you M&Ms. I was doing all my you know, positive, negative reinforcement, and I thought I was brilliant. And they seemed to understand. Yes, I understand. 
Now, of course, these kindergarten teachers get it. And as soon as we got to the concourse, I was saying, stay together, and there was apparently a big sign that only they saw that said, run, and off they ran. So it took me three trips. I was like this hapless 20-year-old teacher chasing them down with a butterfly net. And, and it took me like three trips to get it. And what I got was that the environment tells you what to do. The environment tells you to be literate or not, to be conscious of numbers or not, to know how to map or not. And we, teachers, policymakers, everybody, but teachers in particular, and I'm singling out teachers partly because a lot of you are teachers, but partly because, this is parentheses, but partly because we tend to say as teachers, I'll get it right when they get it right. I'll get it right when the legislature gets it right. Don't hold your breath. I'll get it right when the administration gets it right. I'll get it right when somebody else gets it right. The trick is to struggle to get it right in spite of all the contextual features that are out there. You can do something in this corner of this classroom right here, right now, that can be part of moving towards the kind of classroom you want to have. But I learned that the environment trump, trumps the lesson. The environment tells you what to do. So I was kidding when I walked in here because before all of you got here, the first people who got here all sat in the back rows. Smart. Why? Because this is an environment that tells you that, you know, and I note, I always note, that nobody came up here and took the microphone. Nobody was telling you not to. Why didn't you just come up and start yakking? You could have, but you didn't. And the reason is the environment tells you, sit there and face forward. And if you get here early, sit near the back because you can escape. If you're in the front, you're kind of stuck. You know, you don't want to embarrass everybody. So environments tell us what to do. And that's true of the airport. It's true of this auditorium. And incidentally, the hidden message in this auditorium, which I reject explicitly and implicitly, is that knowledge exists here and reception of knowledge exists there. I think that's nonsense. On the other hand, I also think it's sometimes worthwhile to read a book or hear a lecture, but I don't buy the the implicit notion that knowledge is in a unidirectional you know, flow. But having said that, you have an environment in front of you. What do you do to make that environment reflect the values you have for children? As early childhood teachers, you create spaces for kids to create and construct and build. When I was an early childhood teacher, I had one wall with easels, right? With paint in front of easels. And in the, in the easels, I had red, blue, and yellow paint. Why? Why did I have red, yellow, blue paint and nothing else? And a whole wall of easels with those paints. Why? Come on, you know. They're the primary colors. Um, why did I have the primary colors? <laughs> exactly. Experimenting at the easels, every month, some kid would say, Bill, look at this. Red and blue is purple. And I could have said if I were a certain kind of teacher. Hector, don't you remember we covered that in the primary secondary color lesson, you idiot. Um, or I could say, which I did say, holy cow, what else can you discover? By working at the easel, what can you discover? What can you construct? Because along with the color purple comes a, con a consciousness that manipulating the environment, working within the environment, I can create knowledge. I can construct knowledge. And along with a lesson on primary and secondary colors comes the notion that I know and you don't know. I will tell you what you need to know when you need to know it. And if you're not interested in primary and secondary colors this month, bad news because it's on the test. Um, you know, and that's, that, I think, has become a metaphor for me through all the years since 1965 that I want to create a classroom, whether it's a graduate school, or high school or elementary school, where the equivalent of red, yellow, and blue is in my classroom. So here's the challenge. How do you do that? That's just one example. When I worked in the juvenile detention center, and this is in Chicago, we have the oldest and largest juvenile prison in the world. It, started, it was begun in the 1890s. It is, it, when I was working there, we had a couple thousand kids under one roof locked up. And in that school, um, the classroom that I worked in was, was um, 
co-taught by a, a former priest, a wonderful, wonderful guy named Frank Tobin. And Frank used to say to me, I create an environment where these kids have to show me their goodness. Wow. Now there's a challenge. How do you create an environment where a kid who's charged with a serious crime has to show you his goodness? How do you create an environment where kids don't just, um, don't just kind of think about democracy, but enact democracy? How do you create a classroom where kids learn to cooperate? My son Malik, who teaches, the, the wise guy who I was telling you about, who teaches middle school math and science, he has his classroom organized in tables. And when he gives new math assignments and things that they're going to work on, he says, I don't want you to ask me a question until the entire table has the same question. What has he done? He's created the conditions where they have to talk to one another about, you know, about, um, they have to teach one another and only come to the kind of authority when they've all been stumped. Another example of creating a certain kind of environment. I have a friend who teaches um, fifth grade, and he, um, the first, okay, th this is to me very interesting, and I hope it is to you, but the first day of school, he always brings his 10-year-olds, these kids are 10 years old, uh, to sit on the rug in a circle, and they talk about the routine of the class and what's going to happen and so on. And at some point he says, I have three rules in this class, and everybody's ears perk up. Rules? Okay, I better pay attention because I better know where the blow is going to come from. <clears throat> so he says, yeah, I have three rules. And what are his rules? Rule number one, you can wear hats. That's crazy. In Chicago, it's an obsession. You're not allowed to wear a hat in class. And the reason is gangs are likely to be there, and hats are a symbol of gangs. As this teacher always said to me, you can read with a hat on. I, you know, I'm not worried about it. So he says, you can wear hats. Immediately, all the 10-year-olds are like, wow, Mr. Wilson's so cool. Second rule, you can chew gum. What? That is really radical. You can chew gum? I mean, the whole school is in, in an obsessive, you know, authoritarian meltdown if anybody chews gum. But Wilson says, you can chew gum. Throw it in the wastebasket on your way out the door because you can't chew it in school, but you can chew it here. Now he's got two out of three rules. You can wear your hat and you can chew gum. Rule number three, this is a learning environment. We have to learn to live together and respect one another and one another's work. Wow. He's just created a standard. It could have been written by the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. He's just created a standard that will create the conditions for the teachable moment to happen again and again. Someone makes a racist crack, let's talk about it. That violates the third rule. Somebody says no girls can come into the block corner, got to talk about that. Uh, somebody accidentally or intentionally tears up somebody else's paper, rule number three. It's the condition by which you can, you know, have a teachable moment in which people learn. Compare that to a school just two miles down the road where I went into the cafeteria and there was a big wooden sign that had rules etched in it. It said, cafeteria rules. Rule number one, no shouting. Rule number two, no throwing food. Rule number three, no fork fights. And I'm like, what? <laughs> fork fights? Not a word about fist fights, knife fights, or gun fights, but apparently something had happened with a spork, you know, um, you know, five years ago or 20 years ago, and it was a rule. And the craziness of that is that in Chicago, when I first was teaching there, the, the, the discipline code was about this thick. It's now about this thick. And the reason is because the adolescent imagination can outstrip anything you can think of. Name a crime, they can think of something else to do. So rather than that approach to rules, the idea of saying, you know, we're a learning environment, we're learning to live together as a standard, that to me is exactly what early childhood people do. We expect a range of normal. We expect to have that kind of um, that kind of classroom.